The Battle of Britain could only be fought by those who were actually trained, equipped, organized, and ready to fight there in the summer of 1940. These were Churchill's few, damn few, he might have added. Britain had to make do with the resources she had in being. It's an odd fact that on the day war was declared, there were more Canadians serving as commissioned officers in the RAF than the total number of officers in the RCAF. Three in every hundred RAF officers were Canadian. One RCAF fighter-equipped unit did make it over in time, though. Number one squadron landed in England in June, just after the fall of France, and three weeks before Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering launched his air fleets against Great Britain. Two years would pass before the authorities recognized the work of the ground crews who toiled from well before dawn until late at night, every night, to ensure that number one squadron's hurricanes were serviceable, fueled, and armed. The senior maintenance NCOs of A and B flights were singled out. Flight Sergeant C.M. Gale was mentioned in dispatches, and Flight Sergeant S.R. Birdies received the British Empire Medal. They were the first of many maintainers to be so recognized for their vital work. As well as Number 1 Squadron, Number 242 Canadian Squadron of the RAF under squadron leader Douglas Bader and other Canadians scattered throughout fighter, bomber and coastal commands were Canada's contribution to that crucial battle. Before it was won, at the end of October, 47 Canadian pilots and aircrew had lost their lives. 242 Squadron went into action on the first day of the battle and scored victories. Number one was held back for more operational training, a lesson learned from committing green pilots too soon to combat flying in the First World War. But the Canadians were soon thrown into the fray. Number one score for the battle was 29 German aircraft shot down, as against 15 hurricanes lost and two pilots killed. Some of the pilots who managed to bail out suffered horrible burns. Perhaps the most remarkable day for number one squadron was September the 27th. Between nine in the morning and four in the afternoon, the squadron's 13 pilots sortied three times. They engaged 70 enemy aircraft and destroyed seven against no losses to themselves. There were individual highlights too. Pilot officer J.E.P. La Richelière of Montreal, for example, scored six confirmed victories in just two days. It was a desperate time for these remarkably young and enormously brave pilots. Number two squadron, RCAF, arrived at the end of 1940 and became 402. Within months, the RCAF in Britain grew to 17 fully formed and operational squadrons, but all was not well. By the end of 1941, the Canadians were credited with just 22 confirmed kills for all five fighter squadrons. 401 and 402 had been re-equipped with Mark IIb Hurricanes. 403 got the spectacular new Mark IVb Spitfires. But 18 months of cross-channel sorties had been less than productive. The older, more experienced Luftwaffe pilots in their Messerschmitt 109Fs proved more than a match for them, outperforming the hurries and at least equaling the spits. To make matters worse, late in 1941, the new and lethal Focke-Wulf 190 made its debut. It was superior at that time to any Allied fighter. As one pilot pointed out, the Spit could outturn a 190, but one couldn't keep turning all afternoon. RAF and RCAF losses became embarrassingly and unsustainably high. Six Canadian fighter squadrons were in action by 1942. One of them suffered perhaps the worst day of the war for any Canadian fighter squadron on the 2nd of June that year. 403 Squadron sortied out on a sweep of France, part of a formation of several RAF units. They were bounced by a swarm of German fighters. Seven of the 11 Spitfires were shot down. In July, 
Both 401 and 402 were re-equipped with Mark IX Spitfires. At last, the Canadians had a machine that could stand and fight it out with the dreaded Fock Wolves. Unfortunately, their first major operation was in support of the Dieppe raid on the 19th of August. It was a disaster for Canadian flyers as well as Canadian soldiers. More than a hundred Allied aircraft were destroyed that day, the heaviest air losses of any day of the war. The RCAF lost 13 aircraft and 10 pilots. In the meantime, Buzz Burling had been making a name for himself with the RAF in Malta. He was a natural pilot and a superb shot. With 32 confirmed kills by the end of the war, he was Canada's top scoring ace. It showed that Canadian pilots were up to scratch. One of the problems with the new of fighter aircraft though, was that throughout 1941, 42, they were used on offensive sweeps over occupied France and low countries. And these offensive sweeps didn't achieve very much. In my view, they were a mistaken policy at the time, and they resulted in, in my view, unnecessary casualties to, our, to our, some of our better pilots. Where our pilots really shone was in night interception, and our night interception squadrons, as early as 1942, I think, were among the best. In April 1943, the man who became the RAF's top-scoring flyer with 38 enemy aircraft to his credit, Wing Commander Johnny Johnson, took over the Canadian wing and led it to a string of spectacular successes. That month, 11 wing racked up 17 kills for only three losses. May and June were equally successful. By the end of 1943, RCAF fighter squadrons were able to claim a total of 135 victories. In the meantime, four night fighter and intruder squadrons had been formed as early as 1941, flying Douglas Bostons and Havocs and de Havilland Mosquitoes. Sweeping out across the North Sea and over occupied Europe, they conducted bombing, strike and night fighter missions. In 1944, 418 Squadron downed 103 enemy aircraft, making it the most successful RCAF fighter squadron of the war. Two Army Cooperation or Reconnaissance Squadrons were formed in 1941, and a third the following year. They flew Curtis Tomahawks. These aircraft weren't really up to facing the enemy's machines, and the units saw little action until 1942, when the first North American Mustangs began to arrive. In the spring of 44, prior to D-Day, three new fighter squadrons were formed around the best, most experienced of the Canadian pilots. After the invasion and all through the summer, losses were light and successes many. The frighteningly powerful Napier-engined Hawker Typhoon was in service now and flown by 438, 439 and 440 squadrons. Its 20 mm cannons and rack-mounted rockets made it a formidable ground attack weapon. And it was used widely in this role, especially in two-ship Rangers and Rhubarbs. squadron in their Mosquito 6s made a specialty of intercepting and downing B-1 buzz bombs either by gunfire or by flying alongside them and flipping them over with their wingtips. This stopped when the pilots heard that the Germans were putting detonators on the B-1's stubby wings. 
418 bagged 68 of them. Two reconnaissance units were organized early in the war for RAF Coastal Command using consolidated Catalinas. And later, the stately Short Sunderland flying boats. Two Canadian Sunderland squadrons, 422 and 423, were based first in Isla in the Inner Hebrides and later in Northern Ireland at Castle Archdale on Loch Erne. They served from 1942 on, flying anti-submarine patrols over the western approaches. Eventually, six RCAF squadrons were formed within Coastal Command and shared in the destruction of nine U-boats in the eastern Atlantic. Large numbers of Canadian aircrew flew with RAF Coastal Command squadrons. RCAF 162 Squadron operated from Iceland under RAF control. In a three-month period, it sank five U-boats, one of them through the gallantry of Flight Lieutenant D.E. Hornell, who was awarded a posthumous VC for the action. In June of 1944, Hornell spotted a U-boat on the surface somewhere off the Shetland Islands. He depth-charged the submarine and sank it, but not before its anti-aircraft gun had scored crippling hits on his Canadian-built consolidated Canso flying boat. Hornell managed to land the flying boat in heavy seas. After abandoning the aircraft, he organized his crew to take turns in their only remaining dinghy. By the time they were rescued, Hornell was exhausted and blind. He died not long after being picked up. Canadians also served in the air in Far Eastern theaters. Among many heroes, one stands out in particular. Flight Lieutenant Virchel became the savior of Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka, when he spotted a Japanese task force en route for the island from his consolidated Catalina flying boat. Before he was shot down and made a prisoner of war, he managed to get off a radio message which allowed the island's forces to organize a defense, which in the end saved the day. 